Mizmor hymn of, of David. Havu Adonai Give to the Lord, Elim. sons of Havu God. Adonai Give to the Ra'os. Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory of his name. Bow down to the Lord in the glory of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is full of power. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord forks the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord makes the wilderness tremble. The Lord makes the wilderness of Kadesh tremble. The voice of the Lord makes the oaks writhe and strips the forest. And in his temple all cries, Glory! The Lord sat enthroned at the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king for ever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. So, so yeah, we, we were talking last time we talked about the, um, the sort of connections between Psalms 7 and 8. And here with, with um, 20, 28 and 29, there are, there are really quite sort of strong connections, aren't there, between, between the two Psalms? I think there are. Uh, you've got Psalm 28 ending with a call of uh, with a call of praise calling on god to, to, to praise sorry calling to praise or save the people save your heritage and then it, and, and then you've got psalm 29 coming in as a response to that sort of um appeal to praise god it's a little bit like the difference between psalm 8 and psalm 9 where you have that call to praise and then psalm 8 is the actual call and then of course you've got the um the use of the hebrew word kodesh which is the word for holy and um, that comes in Psalm 29, verse 2, and also in the second verse of 28. Um, so you've got the, and the, he, the Hebrew word barak, which is to bless, again, comes at the end of, of, um, of Psalm 29 and the beginning of Psalm, uh, end of Psalm 28, beginning of Psalm 29. So you've got lots of connections. It's as if this psalm is a response in the sort of way that the Psalter works out to, to, to that call. And I really love the way that in Matthew's, in Malcolm's, in Malcolm's um, poem, you've got the call of Christ to, 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 in the, the end of Psalm 28 and the beginning of Psalm 29, you have the same thing brought out. So the two are connected together in the same mm. way. So it's yeah, the other thing I felt about that balance and kind of antithetical thing between 28 mm. and 29 was, you know, in um, 28, it, the psalmist is asking God to hear his voice in verse two. Yes, hear yes, the voice yes, yes yeah. And in a sense, 29 replies by saying, well, hear my voice. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes. hear what the voice of the Lord has to say on this as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. There's that as well. Yeah, no, well, that, that, talking about two different voices, it's, it's great um, to, well, to join for you to join us again for the, these conversations where we're bringing different voices together. As those of you who have been following them will know, we the starting point was, um, was first of all, these two books that um, Malcolm and I wrote during lockdown last year. One was um, Malcolm's book, David's Crown, which is 150 poems responding to the 150 psalms. And um, the Book of Praises, which was my book of selection of, of illustrations and uh, 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 and translations of, of the psalms and as I said we started these during lockdown last year but we're we're sort of continuing them and we're we're hoping um, for instance later maybe this month to have another conversation with um, Makoto Fujimura the painter who has been doing paintings responding to, to the psalms and we might talk with him about Psalm 23 and then um, maybe with with um, uh, Jack Redford, the, the composer who's been uh, who's set many of the psalms to music. But as you see, today we're delighted to be joined again uh, by Susan Gillingham, who's the emeritus professor of the Hebrew Bible at, at, at Oxford. And in addition to many other things, has has been writing this tremendous multi-volume. Um, 
book of, of uh, psalms through the centuries, uh, a reception history, um, which is looking both at the, the way different traditions have responded to the psalm, not only in, in sort of commentaries and theology, but in art and music uh, and, and literature. And this was volume two, and volume three is, is with, she's just about to receive the, uh, the proofs of, and will hopefully be with us next year, which is, which is very exciting. So, so perhaps we could we could start uh, talking about Psalm twenty nine with with talking about the the way that it has been received in in different traditions and and I was particularly fascinated by what you write about the the way um, that the sort of Jewish and Christian people have responded to the the um, some of the the numerical patterns in in the Psalms and the, the sort of link of this with with, with, the, with the temple and, and, and so on absolutely. I think you've got the threefold ascribed to God, which gives you a, a nice number three, which is obviously important in both Jewish and Christian religion. You've got the sevenfold voice of God, call, you know, the God which, which actually uh, comes through the storm. It could be the thundering of God or the lightning, but that number seven, of course, is really important in, in Jewish thinking. It reminds me very much of the seven times in creation God speaks and brings the world into being. So that's quite an important sort of connection. But of course, it's also linked very much to the idea of the Sabbath, seven days a week and resting. And this psalm has got an incredible feel to it, where it's terribly powerful and at the very end, and they're almost feeling like it's in the eye of the storm. You have everything silent, and, and then that call of, of praise, which, which comes out um, about the um, Lord sitting enthroned on the flood and then bless the Lord. And it's, it's got that sort of sense of, of, of God's rest, perhaps, and our rest out of that seven uh, experience of the seven, seven times. In Jewish liturgy, of course, it's played a really important part in the Sabbath liturgy. Um, and also there's another um, aspect of it. This is the number 18 is also uh, quite a, an important number. And um, you've got um, the 18 benedictions that, um, that, 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 that it's the name of God that comes 18 times right. and the 18 benedictions, it's actually 19 benedictions but again they play an important part in Jewish liturgy and that's why the psalm is also used very much um, in, in daily worship as well as in, in Sabbath times. Then think of the number seven in Christian tradition. Some people have even tried to write the seven sacraments into the psalm because water plays an important part in the, in the first in verses three and four and of course linking that with the baptism perhaps people have found also the early fathers found all seven sacraments sort of working away in in the so you know the number seven uh, does play a part but the number 18 in jewish tradition particularly and uh, the number three for the trinity in christian tradition so the numbers do work very well yeah, yeah. i mean that, you that usual <laughs> big crafting of the psalm doesn't it that care that's you know, because you can read Psalm twenty nine as a, because of the power of the of the the invocation of the mighty rushing winds and storms, you can read it almost in a post romantic way as a pure effusion, like a sort yeah. of psalmic version of Shelley's Ode to the West Wind. So it's wonderful to hear from you, Sue, how how closely and carefully and numerically constructed it is. That's fascinating insight. Yes. Yes. I think as a psalm itself, it is, it's got it, it, a bit like Psalm 8. You know, it has, Psalm 8 began and ended with the refrain, you know, to praise the name of God. And this is, goes actually from the beginning to the end. It ends with that sort of sense of rest from that power at the beginning. But I think the structure is quite interesting with the wilderness in the middle as well. Oh, yeah. Part of the structure. Yes. And I love the way it, it kind of locates there, right? The end is, is also within the temple, that in the temple, yes, <laughs> all right. those have this sort of huge temple of God's creation, but also the. the um... I should have said something about that as well in Jewish worship. That's not necessarily to do with the numbers, but you have this idea perhaps of God in his heavenly temple at the beginning, where the heavenly beings are called to praise on God, a little bit like in Isaiah 6, where you have holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. But you have the sense of, of the, the holy place, where at the end, it could still be the temple, it still could be the heavenly temple, or it could be, because we talk about the people and God blessing his people, the earthly temple. So you have that movement between heavenly praise and earthly praise. And a lot has been played on that in both Jewish and Christian tradition in liturgy, because, of course, that's a sort of duality of praise. And I don't know how it is in the Hebrew in terms of the word order, but I find it very moving in the Coverdale translation of this psalm, which is the one that I was working with and from for my poetry sequence, that the last word in Coverdale 
of Psalm 29 is peace. Peace it is, yes, that's right. You know, yes. The Lord should yeah. give his people the blessing of peace. And yeah. it really peace. up the storm. You know, it's a really deep peace because it's, I mean, there's the terror in a way of the voice yes. that breaks the cedars. And I think it expresses what may be for us a more and more strong contemporary experience with climate change of the sheer terror of the unleashing of massive natural yes. forces that yes. flood yes. and wind breaks the trees. But then there's that fantastic image of the Lord sitting above the waters. Yes. Above yes. the heavens. I always felt that was almost a looking back to the moment of creation and dividing the waters. Yes. Tohu Wavohu is down there. And, and no matter what happens, there is a God who transcends these things, you know, as yes. well as. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, one of the things you point out, in, which I hadn't, I'm not passed me by, but but this is the, the verse that um, that Herbert, I mean, in from, from 29, that uh, in his temple, all speak of his honor, all, all yes. by glory. Yes, I use that the, the, bit, the thing that he uses right in the, the front of the uh, mm. of, of the temple. And uh, Epigraph, yeah. my illustrations, I, it's one thing I actually borrowed from her, but he's got that wonderful poem, Easter Wings, which is actually yeah. uses the shape of the wings. And so I, I've, in my in my sort of, um, the way I've sort of set out the, 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 the type here, I've, I've slightly borrowed that to echo the, the sense of the, the way the psalm begins with the sons of God and, uh, and because it is, it is again like like some sort of nineteen. Yeah. This, this whole sort of, of creation being involved, and as you say, the the terror, but also, I mean, you bring this out really well, Malcolm, in, in the poem that there is this this ending with peace. That it's actually yes, there is there is it is the voice that we know in Jesus as well that is speaking to us. Yes, well, of course, in this as in all the poems, I've been. Uh, I mean, while I'm well aware of the of the original context, and it's always fantastic to learn more about them from from Sue, but as well as the reception, but. I followed the pattern of the New Testament and the early church in essentially reading these psalms Christocentrically and seeking Christ in and through them, both on the basis that he would have had all these prayers on his lips, but also that he identified himself with various figures. So in a sense, my, my poem is a prayer addressed to Christ. I was particularly, um, you know, uh, struck by this movement between 28 asking to be heard yes yes 29s um christ god asking us asking to be heard and saying hear the voice and the, and the psalm hearing the voice and uh, i and my hinge as it were between the two psalms was the was the image of a gate uh, a sense yes. the gate that opens both ways you know that sense the gate of the ear yeah. that, that you know we're the voices the two voices must go each way which is why it's it's uh, it's it's wonderful that that uh, it kind of moves in the end twenty nine into worship. Um, You've created a very gentle voice, the voice of Christ that stirs our you know stirs our sleeping conscience. It's, yes, it's, I, it's a quiet voice. It's not this powerful, terrifying one. You well, that's really well, I, I have the powerful voice. Earlier. What I wanted to do is to find a way in my re, in my my response. Of course, it's not a translation, but. I, I note in Psalm 29 a modulation, I think, as the musicians would say, between this huge, powerful thing and the rivers mm -hmm. in spate and, and mm -hmm. the wind that breaks the cedars mm -hmm. to, to something, um, uh, speaking of peace, because that's the last word in yes. Coverdale. Yes. And the question I ask myself is, OK, this is a poem in response to a psalm, which is essentially about what the voice of the Lord is, about hearing the voice. What kind of voice does he speak with? So I thought, well, how is that modulated or reinterpreted for those who who want to hear not only God speaking in Christ, but as it were, to, to layer it a little bit further, to speak God speaking in Christ as we encounter Christ in others, so I talk about it, the voice that pleads with us upon the poor's behalf and bleeds out from compassion's wounds, mm -hmm. that we might also hear the voice of Christ in the cry of the needy. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. That's very powerful. Roger, your, your depiction of, of, of this psalm in, in the book of praises um, is actually much more the powerful storm god picture. I mean, it made me think of that Phoenician hymn to the storm god, you know, the way you've got uh, the, the sevenfold, uh, Baal thunders, Baal seven lightnings and thunders. Yours is full of sort of, the, you know, the 
the engraving. Yeah, I just well, want... it's, it's, it's a gift to a painter. But but I end like Malcolm with the, I mean, the it's quite the, the the image of the rainbow. It's actually sort of Christ on the yeah. on the sort of calming the storm, um, which is it kind of brings those two things together. Um, the, the actual the storm, but then the I mean, which is almost like a, a, a yeah. Elijah, isn't it, with the the, the thunder yeah. of the rain, yes. the small yeah. voice, yeah. Which, which I think you reference as well, sort of slightly, Malcolm, in, in the poem. I think perhaps yeah. it would be, it'd be good to um, to. to there's a good point to have to have the poem uh, in its full. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, happy to do that. So, Psalm 29, Efferte Domine. Call us, O Christ, and open up the gate. Call us to worship with your mighty voice, the voice that sings through rivers in full spate, the voice in which the forests all rejoice, the voice that rolls through thunderclouds and calls the deep seas and steep waves the quiet voice that stirs our sleeping conscience and recalls us to the love we had abandoned, leads us through the parting mists of doubt, or falls upon us like a revelation, pleads with us upon the poor's behalf, blazes in glory from each burning bush and bleeds out from compassion's wounds. The voice that raises our drooping spirits till we dance for joy and gives us too a voice to sing his praises. <laughs>